Welcome to an overview of Hebrew 1 and 2, Bright Old Testament 502-504. This review is intended to be a review of elementary Hebrew for those going into Hebrew exegesis. This review will be quick and will not cover everything, but will cover the basics that need to be known for exegesis. So let's dive in. It's possible that you may need to review the alphabet. Keep in mind that five of the letters have a final form. Dalet, Mem, Nun, Pe, and Sade all have two forms, one in the word, one at the end. Three categories of Hebrew consonants to keep in mind. Final form, in which five letters have a form in the middle of the word that is different from the ending of that same letter if it occurs at the end of a word. Gutturals, of which there are four, and sometimes five, with Resh pretending it's a guttural, and Bagad Kafat letters that have a soft pronunciation and a hard pronunciation, with the hard pronunciation indicated by a dagesh line. The dagesh line does not double the consonant, although any schwa under a dagesh line will still be vocal. Typically, we only worry about bait, vate, pe, fe, but some prefer to pronounce all of these differently. Hebrew vowels, A class, I class, U class, short, changeable long in which they will reduce in certain cases, and unchangeable long that will not reduce because of the presence of the helping consonant. Memorize this chart well. Two kinds of Hebrew syllables, closed and open. There is only one vowel per syllable, so the second consonant of a closed syllable will have a silent schwa. This is the Hebrew definite article, he plus a patak plus a dagesh. The Hebrew conjunction is vav, with the most important vav being the vav consecutive, vav plus a patak plus a dagesh in the first root letter of the verb, that is often found in narrative. Here's a few Hebrew prepositions, keeping in mind that if there is a definite article, the definite article will drop, and the preposition will take the vowel of the definite article. The direct object marker is typically aleph tav with an e-class vowel, either seire or segol. However, when added to a pronoun, the aleph will take an O-class vowel, either a holum or a holum bav. Hebrew nouns are either masculine or feminine, singular, plural, or dual. You can see the endings here. Nothing in the masculine singular, hirik yod mem in the masculine plural, kamets he, or perhaps a patak or segol tav in the feminine singular, ot in the feminine plural, and ayim or atayim in the dual. Hebrew adjectives have the same endings as Hebrew nouns. They will agree, in the attributive sense, with the noun in all aspects, gender, number, and definiteness. So, ish tov is a good man. If, however, it is a predicative use and it is the man is good, the predicate will not agree with the noun in definiteness, only in gender and number. Demonstratives may be used as adjectives or as pronouns. This, that, these, those. Either this man or this is the man, where this is being used as a substantive, used as the subject. We have several words that ask questions at the beginning of a clause or at the beginning of a word. We also have the interrogative particle, which asks the question, sort of like a question mark, although it comes first in the clause or the sentence. It is he plus a patak shva. Not he plus a patak and a dagesh, that would be the definite article. This is he plus a patak shva. Hebrew nouns go into construct when they're in relationship with other nouns, similar to the genitive in Greek or adding the word of in English, the city of Chicago. City is in construct with Chicago. In Hebrew, we use different endings, different from the absolute noun, to mark the nouns that are in construct keeping in mind that there is one absolute noun and there could be any number of construct nouns. The endings are a ah in the feminine singular, which becomes ot. Ot stays the same in the feminine plural. The masculine singular stays the same, but hirik yod mem in the masculine plural becomes seire yod. Here are the pronominal suffixes. Again, keeping in mind that nouns typically take type one unless they're plural and use a connecting vowel to take type two. Remember the pattern again, cough is always second person, mem is masculine, nun is feminine. It's worth mentioning that two of the prepositions, cough and mem, really like to take a different form when they're added to the pronominal suffixes. 
We need to be aware of the doubling of the mem in min and the adding of the holum vav in the kaf. Well, that brings us then to verbs, keeping in mind that there are seven different stems of verbs, kal, nifal, hifil, hafal, pl, pual, and hithpael. We also have perfect and imperfect verbs, strong and weak verbs. Strong verbs are those verbs that will keep all three of the base letters through all of the verb forms. Weak forms will lose or sometimes double a particular letter, depending on the verb stem. Cal verbs are the simplest, hence the name cal, meaning swift. Perfect are what we often call the subformative form of the verb, meaning that there are suffixes that indicate the subject markers. The nice thing about the perfect is that the subject markers are the same for all seven stems, and you can see them here listed in red. There is great debate among scholars as to whether or not perfect and imperfect are verb aspects, the perfect being a perfected aspect or completed action, the imperfect being incomplete action, or whether or not perfect and imperfect are simply tenses, perfect typically being the past or the present, imperfect typically being the future. Either way, we typically translate the imperfect as a future, and the form of the imperfect is yik tol, as you can see at the bottom of the page, yod with a hyric, is the preformative. We call this the preformative rather than the subformative because there are prefixes as the subject markers, although you'll notice that several of them have a prefix and a suffix, but there is at least a prefix. And typically in the cow, the theme vowel is a holum that O that you see over the tate here in the example yik tol. Again, the subject markers are in red, the combination of the prefix and the suffix, and this is the imperfect, that which is translated as future or perhaps incomplete action. The imperative in the cal stem is only found in the second person because it's an imperative, you. It is formed simply by dropping the prefix off of the imperfect, keeping everything else the same. So you'll notice that the second masculine singular, tik tol, drops the tav plus the hyric and simply remains with katol, keeping the schwa under the kof as though the tav and the hyric were still there. Except in the second masculine plural, we have tik talu, where the schwa under the kof is silent. Once the tav plus the hyric is dropped, the schwa under the kof by rule must become vocal. But then we have two vocal schwas, katalu, and this is not allowed. So instead, the first schwa becomes a hyric and the second schwa becomes silent, kit lu. Again, we drop the prefix off the front to form the imperative, keeping whatever suffix might be present from the subject marker so that it is left dangling at the end of the word as though the Tav and the Hyrek were still there, only they are not. Just to be confusing, not only do we add subject markers to the end of verbs, we also add objects to the end of verbs. These are the same pronominal object endings that we placed on the end of nouns, only instead of indicating possession, they now indicate the object of the verb's action. You can see the object endings listed in red on the right-hand side of the page. Again, keeping in mind they are the same as what you've already seen when we dealt with the objects on the end of nouns. Typically, we use the type 1 suffixes that you can see in the left column on the left side of the page, but often we use the type 1 alternate, these older archaic endings or shortened endings that often occur in the Old Testament. We need to make sure that we're familiar with the ones on the left, but also the ones in that center column. They're translated the same, they just look a little different. There are two types of infinitives. Here in the cal stem, we have the infinitive absolute. It's called absolute because it stands alone without prefixes or suffixes, usually for emphasis. We translate this with to, if it's by itself, as in to kill. But if it's used as emphasis, we often translate it as surely. The giveaway of the infinitive absolute is the holum vav after the second root letter. The most common form of the infinitive is the infinitive construct. It's construct because it can take prefixes and suffixes and is used else in the sentence besides simply emphasis. Because it is construct, we identify it by reduction. The comments under the kof here has been reduced to the schwa, and the holum vav will often, although not always, reduce simply to a holum. 
it is still translated as to, as in to kill or to say. However, its use in the sentence may cause it to be translated slightly differently. But again, this is still an infinitive. In English, we typically think of the participle as that word that ends in ing. And that's often how the Cal active participle is translated as well. Although sometimes it can be translated as a substantive, as a noun, such as the killing ones or the murderers, rather than killing, simply. Here we have the endings of the Cal active participle. You'll notice that they are very similar, in fact, identical to the endings of the noun. That's because a Cal active participle acts like a noun or an adjective. The giveaway is that this is a co-tail form where we have a holum after the first root letter and typically a sere after the second root letter. Also, you have a verb with noun endings, which should be giveaways that you have a participle. The cal stem is unique in that there is also a passive participle. You'll notice that it's a passive participle because you have a U-class vowel, typically a shurik, although occasionally a kibitz, after the second root letter. The cal stem is the only stem to have the passive participle. The next stem we'll look at is the nifal stem. The nifal perfect is indicated by the nun hiric prefix. All other forms of the nifal have a comets under the first root letter plus a dagesh in that first root letter. Unless, of course, the nun shows up, as in the participle and infinitive absolute, in which case the nun prefix is the giveaway of the nifal. The imperative and infinitive constructs both have a hifial prefix and occasionally in the infinitive absolute. However, it is that comets in the dogesh in the first root letter that indicates this is a nifal. The nifal stem is typically referred to as the passive stem. That's a stereotype, not always the case. The hifial stem is the causative stem. Again, a stereotype, not always the case. The hifial stem is indicated in the perfect by the hey hiric prefix. Typically, there will be a hiric yod in between the second and third letters, although occasionally there is a patak there instead. Look for the hey hiric prefix. In all other forms, we look for the patak. The patak, typically a long I class vowel in between the second and third letters, either a se re or a hiric yod. In the participle, from the hifal, hafal, pl, pual, and hifpael, we look for the mem prefix. Again, the patak is the giveaway in the imperative, infinitive, and the participle. You'll notice that we have a he prefix in the imperative and the infinitive, just like we did in the nifal. However, in the nifal, the second letter, which in this case would be the first root letter, had a comments. Here, though, we're looking for the patak under that preformative he. The hafal stem is the causative passive, caused to be. Like the hifial, it is a he prefix. However, instead of looking for a patak, instead we look for a u-class or a short o-class vowel. Again, we have the mem prefix in the participle. You'll notice that we have the kibitz in the perfect or a kamatsatuf, and the same in the imperfect. There is no infinitive hafal in the Old Testament. Remember that certain weak verbs will lose letters off the front of the verb. For instance, a one nun verb will drop the nun in the imperfect in the other stems and instead put the dagesh in the second root letter, taking the place of that first nun and allowing a short vowel to remain in the preformative. In the cal stem, yod and he will often drop and leave behind a sere. Yod will occasionally leave behind a hiric yod. In the nifal, hifil, and hafal, there is a predictable pattern of what happens with the first yod verbs and some first he verbs. In the nifal, it will become a holum bob or a full consonant to carry that comets. In the hifil, it becomes also a holum bob, although you'll notice that the nifal perfect and participle with a one yod verb have the nun prefix. Hifils have a he prefix or no prefix, in which case they will just be the holum bob. So unless you see a nun prefix, you know that it's a hifial. Hafals have a shurik instead of the holum vav, a u class instead of an o class, since hafal has that o ha fal that becomes the hu fal. The hifial is the one that becomes ho. 
So we could really call this the no foul, the ho foul, and the who foul as our mnemonic to remember what happens in one yod and some one he verbs. Stereotypically, the PL stem is the intensive stem, although again, that is a stereotype since we have some verbs that only occur in the PL stem. In the perfect, we have no prefix, just a heric under the first root letter and a doubling via a dogesh in the second root letter. In the imperfect and the participle, we look for the schwa under the prefix, followed by a patak vowel and a dogesh in the second root letter. In the imperative, the prefix has dropped off with the schwa, but still we have that patak vowel with the dogesh in the second root letter. The imperative to ms is identical to the infinitives. Keep in mind that in some instances, we have a guttural as our middle root letter, and it will not take a dogesh. Instead, it will lengthen the previous vowel. So in the perfect, the heric becomes a sere. In other forms, the patak becomes a kametz. We looked for the kametz in the nifal, but there we had a prefix, either a nun or he prefix. Without a weak vowel, instead in a strong vowel, we might get tripped up saying, but the hifiel also has a patak. But there the patak was under a prefix. Here the patak is under the first root letter. The pu'al is often stereotypically referred to as the intensive passive. There are only three forms, perfect, imperfect, and participle. As is typical of the participle, as we've seen, we have the mem prefix, again with the schwa. However, instead of having a patak under the first root letter, we have a u-class vowel, because this is the pu'al. In the imperfect, we also have the schwa, and again, a u-class vowel, pu'al. And as would be expected in the perfect, we have the u-class vowel, with all three having a dogesh in the second root letter. By far, the easiest stem to recognize is the hith pael. You'll notice the hith or the yith on the beginning of each of these verb forms, and that it looks like a pael with the patak under the first root letter and a dogesh in the second. There is quite a bit of overlap between the various forms of the hith pael verb, both the perfect strong verb, the imperative strong verb, the infinitive construct and the infinitive absolute. Only the imperfect looks different, and many times context will have to tell you what form we're dealing with. One quirk of the hith pael is that if the first consonant is a s sound, a sibilant, it will switch places with the tav. After tsade, the tav will actually become a tet. So you see instead of hitsater, we have histater. Here is a quick review of the participle in all the stems keeping in mind that cal has a holum vav after the first root letter or a shurik after the second root letter, depending on if it's an active participle or a passive participle. Nifel has a nun prefix, but everything else has a mem prefix. Pl and puel have schwas followed by their vowels. The hifil and the hafel also have mems. Mem with a patak is a hifil, and then with a u class or o class is a hafel, and then mit is the hithpael. Again, Rebarize these because it will tell you which participle in which stem you're dealing with. We also have weak verbs. All the other forms we've been talking about are strong verbs. Remember that weak verbs do crazy things. We might have a guttural in our first root letter, which will change some of the vowels to A-class vowels. We may have a guttural in our third root letter, which will also change some of the vowels to A-class vowels, rather than the predicted E or I-class vowel. We also have some first-class alephs that will change the preformative letter to a holum so that we have yomer instead of what we would expect as yimor. We also have some verbs that will drop particular letters, such as hey verbs. Hey at the end of a word will typically drop out. It'll become a yod before certain letters. It'll become a shurik before certain letters. But typically, at least in the three MS, we can use it to diagnose what verb we're actually looking at. So in the perfect, it will end in comets hey. In the imperfect, it will end in a segol hey. The imperative masculine singular form is sere hey. The infinitive construct of a third hey verb is always oat, and the participle is always segol hey. So third hey verbs can be very helpful in determining what form of the verb we're looking at.
Well, that brings us to the end of our review of elementary Hebrew. Hopefully now you remember everything you ever learned about Hebrew and you're ready for exegesis.